it's time to start a new project. I'm going to make OG molding planes. And I'm going to make two different size planes, but I'm going to make a right hand plane and a left hand plane for each size. So that will be a total of four planes. And um, one will be based on a 3 8 radius, one set, and the other set will be based on a 7 16 radius. And I'm going to go ahead and show how I laid this out. This is the, I'm not sure which one this is, this is probably the 7 16 Okay, so if you imagine that this is a three-quarter inch board, this is the upper surface of the board. Uh, in my detail, it has a little step, and then it has a three-eighths outside curve. Directly tangent to it is a three-eighths, a seven-sixteenths inside curve, and then the remainder of it is basically another eighth of an inch to the bottom of the board. So this would be a very nice uh, shelf edge. And the idea is that, let's see if I could get something to point this out, because these points are very small, and I want everyone to understand how this is going to work. So, you can see the remnant of this layout line that disappears through here, but this point right here, the tangent point, and this point are all in a straight line. And that also gives you your spring angle because when you cut this shape into a board your your plane will be at an angle in relation to the board and what I did was I drew uh, what the bottom of the plane would look like including the spring angle and that's this right here so now if we assume that this is what we'll eventually end up with, we can put this to the side and then deal with just this shape as the bottom of the plane. Now the idea of the spring angle is that relative to the, I was going to zoom out a little bit, okay, so now this would be the body of your plane. Okay, and right through here would be where your wedge is. And then this side would be the escapement. And the idea is that this general access line through those three points is 90 degrees to the side of the plane. And that really benefits the plane maker or the user in two ways. One is that it's um, it, it by doing this this way it creates the spring angle and it makes it easier to use the plane because you're pushing the plane on an angle into the wood and maintaining that cutting pressure and the other thing that happens I can illustrate it with uh, one of the one of the planes I recently made but it's pretty obvious that the escapement tapers and as it goes up it opens now down here you have a very small area right in front of the blade that creates the curl in the shavings and it makes a very smooth cut because this opening is more or less even though it's a curve even though it's a curve it's generally parallel to the to the face of the blade in a general way because it's the, that's the the orientation that allows it but this down here is a complex shape because the cutter also includes the step and then the two curves so in order to keep the opening square to the side of the plane in the bottom of the plane where it would be 
in the same way it is in this plane, the opening directly in front of the blade. In order to keep that as small as possible, it has to be 90 degrees to the body of the plane. If for some reason you were to choose to hold the plane this way in relation to your, to your, your board, then the, the, uh, the shape of the plane would have to rise upwards. And then into the, and as it went into the escapement, the escapement would grow, and you would have a, a greatly opening mouth in the plane body in front of the blade. And uh, you wouldn't be able to get a, a smooth cut. And I also believe that the plane makers back in the day also realized that this is an easier plane iron to shape when you have the long part that comes down where the wedge is, and then you have this flag with this shape in it. So there are a great many benefits to creating the spring angle. Now, for the plane maker, there's one added benefit. And the added benefit is that the access, the relative orientation of this curve in relation to this plane body is also 90 degrees. So the center line of this curve is parallel to the side of this plane body. So what I've gone ahead and done is I've set up a jig right here. I have my layout on the side of the ends of this plane body. This is just a raw blank. And I'm able to take this plane and by using a 90 degree block that's clamped in a, a specific location, I'm able to use it as a guide and make one of the cuts. And so I went ahead and did that. And then what I also did, let's see if I could find the other piece. Well, it's under here, I can't show it. But what I can also do then is after I make the first cut, is I take this block and I orient it to the other side of this layout line. And then I take the other shape, which is the mate to the first plane that I'm using, and then cut the other shape in the other direction. And there's only two shapes in the bottom of the plane. And then after I have that, then I'll relieve, um, relieve the bottom of the plane and cut all the other angles and steps. But I'm choosing to start with the two curves. So that's the general idea on how you make and lay out OG molding planes. So I'm going to take a few sh seconds to do my finalize my setup and then film a little bit of uh, making the uh, shaping the bottom. So we'll see how it goes. just started making cuts with the hollow plane on the last OG plane that I have going here. And I did two things. Uh, I resharpened the blade. I went to 1200 grit on the, uh, the back face of the blade and the bevel. And I reset the blade very fine. And before I set the blade, I took some paste wax and I waxed the face of the blade that's the face of the wedge that's beveled to push the trip to the to the side. And I paste waxed the uh, the other side of the uh, wedge mortise where the friction builds up for the shaving. And what I found is that that makes a difference between night and day. So this is almost a full cut. Now I just want to admit that this grain is very forgiving. This appears to be really, really soft and it's like neutral grain. This is like, this is coming out like butter. So I don't want to 
pretend that that this is tough grain. But what's happening is I can make a full pass with very little effort and I pull the chip completely out. There's no there's no binding. So what's happening is, I'll do it again. What's happening is the chip is moving upwards because I reduced the friction in this area with the paste wax. So what was happening previously was right here it would just start to bind up and as it bound up it would move outwards and push the plane away from the guide block. So in this case is the cut isn't that long it's only 12 and a half inches long but I can do the full pass without any binding and then it's a full it's a full shaving so if I could grab it with my fingertips I can just pull it out now previously it was binding in such a way and it was fracturing and being compressed in this area and I, I couldn't grab it with my finger so I would say that I wish I knew to put the uh, the paste wax earlier and I, I should have known better I should just go ahead and do that before I right after I complete any plane I should just apply the, the paste wax and proceed from there and that's probably what I'm going to do with these molding planes once I once I finish these the first thing I'm going to do is put the paste wax in there and then that way they'll be good to go but this is part of the learning process and the reason I'm filming it is because I want everyone to see what the results are and what they look like this is coming out amazing and it's easy because I believe because of the combination of going to the 1200 grit setting it really really shallow and then putting the wax on the wedge and on the mouth of the plane and then getting a really good cut with it so I'm going to continue with this I have uh, some work I did in the last cup day or so uh, with all the guide blocks on the four jigs that I made so once I finish this I'm going to go on to the next step After I completed the first two planes and shaped the bottoms, uh, I started to try and compare them in a very accurate way in terms of the profiles. And uh, even though by measuring with the micrometer they were off about five thousandths of an inch and I thought that that was acceptable, I thought that I could also get them a little closer. So what I did was uh, I ba I'm basically using three straight edges. <clears throat> I have a saw fence that I made which is very straight. I have a piece of timber underneath it that these are registering on that keep these in a straight line. That's been milled by hand and that's very straight. And then I have an identical piece of timber here to compress these against this straight edge and hold everything in place so that I can so that all this resists the force of the planes passing over it so then I started checking it again with the micrometer <clears throat> and also with the straight edge and I realized there was a slight hump in one uh, one plane and also the end the, 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 two, the center was a little high so what I did was I adjusted both ends and then connected everything in a straight line they're very straight now <clears throat> this is this is very very nice so my and the reason I came up with this idea was because this is how I originally wanted to cut both planes but because I had to offset the straight edge and run this plane runs out here 
So there really wasn't, I could have done it, but I don't have access to a table saw all the time. I would have had to make multiple cuts. So what I did was I chose to cut each plane individually, and it just so happens that I was able to come back here now and just do this freehand, <clears throat> but tune them up and, straight, and straighten them. So now, for all intents and purposes, they're clones of each other. So I'm going to make one plane a right-hand plane and one plane a left-hand plane, but you can be, I'll be able to interchange each plane and cut virtually the same profile. Um, I'm real happy with the way this came out. I was worried about the grain direction and how the, how the hollows and rounds would perform. And of course, holding these perfectly straight in, in both, both axes. But I got it all, and this is the way I would do pairs of planes from now on. So I wanted to film this because this is a complicated setup, and now I have to take all this away and go on to something else. Um, but I think this is the way to go. Okay, I have a uh, one of my mortising jigs set up. Um, what I want to do is I want to glue the glide the guide block in place for it. So I have the blank set up just as if I was ready to start the mortising. The guide block is in place. Uh, let me just show what it looks like just so you get an idea. Looks like the, looks like it's one of these. It's one of these mortising jigs that I make. Uh, I can't use the one that I made for my other set of planes because now this is going to be a 3 a 3 8 wedge and it's going to be 3 8 from the edge so the first guide block that I'm going to glue to the jig is going to be a total of uh, 3 quarters of an inch from the face of the plane so what I did was I clamped the, the jig in place then I took a piece of scrap block that's got a very straight edge on it and that's to extend this line up past the jig. Uh, I have a three-quarter chisel and what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna put some, I'm gonna do this rather than showing it after it's complete and describing it I'm gonna go ahead and just make it make it up right now so I have some glue and I'm going to put some glue on the block. You know, really don't need that much. And uh, I'll trim it all later. But the idea is to just get this in place. So I'm going to use a three-quarter chisel as my spacer. And that's going to be the extreme side of the mortise pocket for the wedge. So I have a clamp that bridges over this guide block. And then what I'm going to do is put this little piece over the guide block and hold it in place. And then I got a little wedge that I cut. Let's see if I could keep that keep that in there. And uh going to have to move this out just a tad more. There's really no room for the wedge. wedge to create pressure off the clamp.
need another wedge. <laughs> Okay, so I got the chisel, the chisel is firmly held in place between the two blocks, the block is held firmly in place with the wedges, and uh, the block is making full contact with the jig, it's kind of hidden under everything, but I can see it's making full contact, so now I'll just let that dry for an hour or so, and then what I'm going to do, I did this on the first jig, take everything apart, leave the clamp in place and then what I'm going to do is use two 3 8 3 16 scraps of steel to make up a 3 8 space and that will be the space for my wedge so I'll put that against the first guide block that I just did and then I'll glue another guide block on the other side leaving the 3 8 space and that's where I'm going to pass my chisel the reason I'm doing all this is because I don't have a 3 8 chisel. So I'm going to use both guide blocks to guide a quarter inch chisel and make a 3 8 pocket. And uh, the idea is that the guide block guides the chisel straight down and everything will be parallel to the side of the plane far enough so that I can finish it with my other tools. But it worked really well with the other one but I only had to do a, uh, a quarter inch mortise with a quarter inch chisel. This is going to be a little bit different. I want to still maintain a little bit of precision in it. So I thought I'd show everybody how I kind of set this up. And uh, I got to do that now for... Um, this, is the, this is for the right hand plane. This is the second guide, uh, guide jig for the right hand planes. And then I have another full set that I have to make that's the mirror image of this for the uh, the left hand planes and um, that's about it we'll go on to something else